Hello, everyone. I have a great pleasure to introduce you now our next speaker, Katja Krause. She's a historian of science, medicine, and philosophy. She received her PhD in 2014 from the King's College London for her dissertation entitled Aquinas Philosophy and the Beatific, Beatific Vision, a textual analysis of his commentary on the sentences in light of his Greek, Arabic, and Latin sources. She is currently leader of the Max Planck Research Group Experience in the Premodern Science of Soul and Body, circa 800 to 1650. Regarding the title of, this, of her conference this evening, we have a small change to announce in the title. The new title is Source Mining, Arabic Philosophy and Inspirantia in Albert the Great's Intellectual Practices. Katja, it's, it's really, really a great pleasure and a great honor to have you here. And Can you hear me? Okay. Well, it's actually a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. And I would like to thank very much the two Alfredos um, and Roberto. Um, for the invitation. Um, I guess it's been one of the most pleasurable conferences I've ever attended in my long life as a scholar. Okay, do I, do I have to move even closer? Okay, great. Um, so I changed the title of the paper because I figured that asking big, big questions and trying to give answers to them is best done um, through small, um, like very close case studies. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. And in light of the late hour and um, the food we're all looking forward to tonight, um, I will speak about two case studies that have to do with the mouth, namely taste and teeth. Um, but the case studies are just means to, end, to, to the end. Um, and the end is basically, I'm going to try to answer maybe two big questions here. Um, the first being, about the historical actors themselves, and in particular, Albertus Magnus, um, which is how and to which ends are sources used by our historical actors. Um, I'm trying to uncover this with these two examples. And then, um, by extension, can we, by turning to these practices, namely source mining, as I call them here, enrich our scholarly pursuits? All right. So sometime during the years 1242 and 1245, when as Baccalaureus Sententiarum, Albert the Great read Peter Lombard's sentences to his students at the University of Paris, he settled seemingly once and for all the matter of authoritative status of the most important sources available to him and to his audience. You know, text one on your handout. It should, as a consequence, be known that Augustine ought to be trusted to a greater extent than the philosophers in matters concerning faith and morals, if there's disagreement. As far as medicine is concerned, however, I trust Galen or Hippocrates more, and as far as natural things are concerned, I trust Aristotle more and other experts in natural matters." Unquote. The other experts in natural matters besides Aristotle are easily identified as sources hailing from Arabic-speaking lands. At the time of writing his early treatise De Homina, whose completion concurred with his teaching activities on the sentences, Abbott explicitly referred to more than a dozen Arabic-speaking thinkers whose works were available in Latin. Whether some of these fell under the category of medicine and others under that of natural philosophy can best be determined on the basis of similar proclamations throughout Albert's natural philosophical corpus yet his intellectual concerns of selecting sources for particular disciplines and his acute abilities for discerning the specific expertise that his sources promulgated arise clearly from this passage. Indeed, from now on, Abbott practiced his divisional scientific pursuit, namely he divided theology and the philosophical corpus, also in his commentary on the sentences, and he put his trust in Aristotle and other experts in natural matters when he erected his own natural scientific system, a system which he began around 1250 when he commented on Aristotle's physics and ended around 1260 when he wrote the question and commentary on Aristotle's De Animalibus. And yet, while the natural scientific system that Abbott thus composed was framed by two commentaries on authentic works of Aristotle, 
it nonetheless added to them considerably. In complete autonomy, Abbott penned no less than eight additional works, as well as commentaries on pseudo-Aristotelian works. He also considerably expanded upon Aristotle's natural philosophical works, and in particular on his De Animalibus. Abbott certainly placed a great value on these additions and additional works in their complementary role for his own comprehensive natural scientific system, a system which was the first of its kind in the Latin West and endured in its unique comprehensiveness well into the 16th century. But this was not their only purpose. Following his Arabic peripatetic sources, Abbott took his comprehensive scientific system as a whole to be required for all those who were serious about attaining a perfect intellect and human happiness in this life. As a consequence, we can say that his separation of philosophy from theology, his granting lead authority to Aristotle and his peripatetic followers for natural philosophy, and the ultimate anthropological value he placed on the scientific corpus all reveal a multiplicity of purposes within Abbott's natural scientific corpus. They also opened up a wide range of interpretive options of the Arabic authorities within more specific scientific endeavors. Indeed, how exactly Abbott followed the lead of his Arabic sources in his adoptions and reworkings of their natural philosophical insights and explanations for each particular topic has been an ongoing concern in contemporary literature. In most cases, this has been approached from the perspective of what I would call a reception history. And there are four particular um, intellectual concerns that have been ascribed to Abbott's way of using sources. The first concerns the faithfulness to the original, um, namely the question or the extent to which Abbott remained truthful or not to the original teachings contained in his sources. The second um, has been an amassing of encyclopedic knowledge of as many sources as possible. The third, avoiding the threat of the double truth, and the fourth, responding to his Latin interlocutors. Now, in my paper today, I wish to complement these four um, explanatory models or approaches by another one that underscores Albert's own purposes and the ways in which he implements them in his natural philosophy. Keeping in mind Abbott's intellectual practices, to use Lorraine Daston's words, his presentation of evidence and arguments, my aim is to investigate when Albert incorporated, how he reworked, and why he mined certain insights and explanations from Arabic natural philosophers. So much about the general, now on to the particular. Concerning the meaning of one particular aspect that the Arabic sources offered Albert, namely the aspect of experiential data, we find that the multiplicity of Abbott's own purposes was not much narrowed. Rather, I contend that uninhibited by original intentions, meanings, and purposes, Abbott's mining of experiential data from his Arabic sources followed his own epistemic concerns. In order to show what these epistemic concerns were and to what extent they deviated from their originals, I focus on two concrete cases drawn from Albert's vast natural philosophical corpus. In what follows, I analyze a case in which Abbott, I call it, transhistoricizes empirical evidence contained in Avicenna's canon of medicine. And I examine another case in which he establishes his mature theory of taste in reliance on Averroes' principle of form-matter relations as the best possible explanation. Now, while this range of cases is highly selective, and does not include experiential data used predominantly for verification and falsification purposes, I nonetheless hope to show that Abbott's intellectual practices encompassed cases of mining his sources that went far beyond concerns of faithfulness to the original, amassing encyclopedic knowledge of as many sources as possible, avoiding the threat of the double truth, and responding to his Latin interlocutors. All right, on to the first case, to T. During the second decade of the 1200s, Michael Scott concluded his Latin translation of Aristotle's De Animalibus from Arabic. Just as in his template, the translation comprised three of Aristotle's works, the Historia Animalium in books 1 to 10, the De Partibus in books 11 to 14, and the De Generatione Animalium in books 15 to 19. 
Before Albert the Great's commentary on the De Animalibus, two further Latin thinkers penned their commentaries on Michael Scott's translation, Petrus Hispanus Medicus, probably, who composed his commentary around 1240, which is extant in two, if we can say that, manuscripts. Um, and Roger Bacon, who possibly composed his commentary somewhat earlier, but which is lost to us. Following Petrus Hispanus' lead, but in his own comprehensive and innovative ways, Abbott incorporated large amounts of Avicenna's canon into Scientia de Animalibus, particularly for human anatomy and physiology. Now Avicenna's canon, his comprehensive five-volume medical work, was translated into Latin in the second half of the 12th century by Gerard of Cremona, in Latin garb, it would become the primary book for the study of medicine in Europe for over five centuries. It was mined by 13th and 14th century Latin philosophers and physicians alike, but predominantly for its ideas in Book I. Among the many anatomical matters discussed by Avicenna in Book I is the question of sensation in teeth. Avicenna shows that teeth are the exception to the general Galenic rule of anatomy that, I quote, no bone has sensation. So this is text three on your hand up. Galen said, Dixit, that experience, experimentum, shows us that they, namely teeth, have sensation. From him we learn that nature took precaution and produced it with a power that originates in the brain so that for this reason they may also discern between hot and cold. In reference to Galen's testimony of his experience, which Avicenna probably derived from his De Ossibus at Tironis, Avicenna emphasized the great spatio-temporal distance between them. Using the past tense, Dixit Galenus, Avicenna located Galen's experience in a deep history that took place many centuries before he retold it in its canon. Avicenna thus created three separate historical moments in which Galen's experimentum Galen's report of his experimentum and his own testimony of Galen's report were separated by historical gaps. These gaps were also, I would say, epistemic gaps. Avicenna provided no report of testing Galen's experience, so he didn't try it out, you know. He could easily try it out with ice cream and say, you know, I tried this out and he's right, but he didn't, or he didn't write it down. Um, Avicenna provided, so Avicenna provided no report of testing Galen's experience, no account of his own sensation in teeth in everyday circumstances, no incident of his patient's pain in teeth. Instead, Avicenna summoned Galen's authoritative experimentum to validate the scientific conclusion that teeth are the exception to the rule. In keeping with his own definition of medicine as scientia parallel to philosophy, Avicenna's intellectual practice, this privileged authority, over the evidentiary value of experimentum and incorporated it into the intellectual activity of argument for a conclusion. In short, Galen's experimentum was inscribed into Avicenna's canon with an authoritative value in support of a theoretical position. Now, in contrast, when Albert the Great extracted these insights from Avicenna's canon and incorporated them into his De Animalibus commentary, he transformed the authoritative value of experimentum into an evidentiary value. In his account, Albert no longer emphasized the spatial, temporal, and epistemic gaps, but rather stressed the empirical warrant that experimentum had for the rational conclusion. And this is text four in your handout. No bone apart from teeth, as Galen and Avicenna say, dikund, has sensation, for they say, dikund, that experience shows that teeth have sensation. And this was decreed by the wisdom of nature, for it made their sense with a power of sense which descends from the brain so that they may also discern between hot and cold. Despite obvious similarities and in insights, Albert's report moved away from Avicenna's emphasis on experience as reported evidence to experience as warranting evidence. His use of present tense, dikund, his conflation of the two experimenta of Galen and Avicenna which weren't experimental, arguably, um, and his separation of reporting about the subjects of the experimenta and the evidentiary function of it all support such reading. Albert's fashioned, Albert fashioned Galen's and Avicenna's experience to be in service of empirically verifying the conclusion that teeth are the exception to the rule, 
rather than emphasizing its authoritative inheritance. He thus privileged the evidentiary value of experience over its authoritative value, regardless of the fact that it was testimonial experience only, because he obviously got it from Avicenna's canon, and integrated it into his predominant intellectual practices of argument and logic. To our tastes, to grant such evidentiary status to the experimentum of Galen and Avicenna seems an inequitable apportioning to the evidence and a potential twisting to the conclusion at hand, but Albert did not fear this kind of epistemic anxiety. His epistemology relied on op optimistic convictions, culminating in his deeply held commitment that, quote, all activities that arise from nature are uniform in all things that possess this nature. Stretching to natural activities and actions carried out to achieve the human desire to know by nature, as Albert elaborates on Aristotle's metaphysics, sense perceptions and the ability to build truthful universals follow the nature of the species of humans. In fact, Albert believed that this uniformity of the nature of humans was true for, and here we have a little caveat, philosophically trained individuals. Um, this principled belief in the uniformity of natural activities explains why Albert saw himself able to integrate Avicenna's reference to Galen's experience into his science of animals the way he did. Albert's reworking reveals the potential to participate in Galen's act of experiencing as testified in Avicenna, not in an experiential way, but in a conceptual way that transcends linguistic, spatial, and temporal boundaries precisely because Abbott took concepts derived from experience to be, in most cases, universally true. And obviously, there are exceptions there, too. The grounds for this sharing lay not in a testing or a repetition of experience as we would have it today, um, and as our ideals demand, but in the firm belief in the correct and shared workings of the human soul we could call it the laws of the soul's activities, if, if you will, um, all of which ensured a continued and universally human epistemology, even for the experiencing of particulars. Now, Albert's inheritance of Avicenna's testimony to Galen's experimentum was therefore not a simple matter of assumption or adoption of sources. It was a matter of reworking epistemic values, a matter of shifting from authority to ev evidence grounded in a firm belief that the principled activities of the human soul are universally shared and have a common goal, namely the perfection of the human intellect. This reworking, however, did not come as an accident. Abbott's intellectual motivation, his scientific program to do so, expresses without a doubt that experimentum in conjunction with ratio lead to definitions of animals, the backbone of his perfect science of animals. And this is text five on your handout, and I'm not going to read it because there's not enough time. So the reworking of epistemic values and its scientific ends and specific definitional knowledge of animals as the quote um, shows, which equals the truth about them were epistemic constants across Abbott's incorporations of Avicenna's empirical evidence in his De Animalibus and elsewhere when referenced explicitly. And yet, the particular practice of reworking authoritative experience into warranting experience cannot be generalized across his works. On the contrary, other uses of experience, such as the construction of a theory as the best possible explanation of experiential knowledge, appear in Albert's treatments of the five external senses. And with this, we move on to the second case, the theory of taste. The correct workings of the soul across humanity, or at least among philosophers, their power to ensure a universally shared epistemology required explanation. Abbott envisioned the right place to do so in his commentary on Aristotle's De Anima. But there were other writings too. Before a solid tradition of commentaries on Aristotle's De Anima was established, Albert favored other places rooted in the Summa tradition of the 12th century. His Summa de Creaturis, comprising the two autonomous books, De Quatro Quo Quevis, 
and the dehomina attest to this vision. In his dehomina, Albert provided his first coherent and sovereign theoretical account of humans and their nature and activities. In his De Anima, Pava Naturalia, and De Natura et Origina Anime, Albert co complemented, perfected, and reworked many of these earlier theories. Now, these general considerations also applied to particular scientific theories. Albert's theory of the sense of taste in its relation to and demarcation from the sense of touch was no exception. So they had to distinguish between taste and touch, and this was a difficult feat. So how did Albert's argument run in his De Homina? Here, Albert described the sense of taste as falling under what seems two strictly separate, merely conceptual reflections for him. Taste is, on the one hand, divided into a sense of alimentation, and on the other hand, a sense of judgment of flavors. In the first meaning, a sense of alimentation, Abbott took taste to be a part of the sense of touch, whereas in the second, as a sense of judgment, he took it to be distinct from touch. Taste shared with touch its generic object of sensation, the four qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry, its medium, the tangible, watery, tasteless liquid, its modality of activity, direct contact between object and subject of sensation, and it overlapped an organic location, the tongue and the palate in the mouth. Yet taste did not share with touch its targeted activity of judging the object that defines the sense of discriminating between the five different flavors that Albert knew in his De Homina of sweet, fatty, sour, bitter, and salty. In shaping these early reflections on taste as sense of alimentation and sense of judgment of flavors, Abbott's reference works remain solely within the horizon of Aristotle's corpus. Abbott explicitly fi fixed his considerations on philosophical principles and conclusions he derived in the following order from Aristotle's ethics, de anima, de senso et sensato, de animalibus, de generatione et cor corruptione, and the physics. First and foremost, Albert promoted Aristotle's passing statement in his Ethica that taste is the judgment of flavor to the distinguishing criterion of taste from touch. No other criterion, in fact, served this purpose. In the solution to follow, Abbott drew on Aristotle's repeated identification of taste as a certain touch from the de anima and the de senso et sensato, but only for taste as a sense of alimentation. To stipulate the first reason for this partial identification of taste and touch, Abbott relied on two principles from Aristotle's De Generatione Corruptione. Alimentation only nourishes through a substance, and taste requires the four elements of hot, cold, wet, and dry to be present alike in our body and in the alimentation. Last but not least, in the third reason for the partial identification, Abbott employed Aristotle's insight in his physics that the termini of these are identical in kind, in order to explain that the tongue as one terminus and the tasted object as another must physically touch one another to produce the sensation of taste. So, no doubt, the variety of selective borrowings from Aristotle's works revealed the young Albert as much an erudite scholar well before the, corp uh, the Aristotelian corpus was officially read in Paris, at Paris in 1255, as they exposed his remarkable sovereignty over the material. Only half of his borrowings originated from contexts in which Aristotle deliberated with focus on the subject matter of taste, and all of them were brought together to provide a well-supported account of the proximity of both senses on the basis of their shared relational and material properties. Yet none of Albert's early borrowings made explicit reference to experience nor did they engage with ideas derived from parallel discussions on taste by Arabic-speaking thinkers, despite the fact that their works were available in Latin and despite Albert's familiarity with them at this point in time. Albert's initial dem demarcation of taste from touch, therefore, followed the target of structuring explanations by way of relational, anatomical, and physiological criteria and it mined Aristotle's corpus accordingly. 
Yet his simple and merely conceptual demarcation of taste as a sense of alimentation and a sense of judgment of flavors was no longer sufficient when he composed his commentary on Aristotle's De Anima. Now, there, Albert's urge to seek a more careful theoretical demarcation of taste from touch, a demarcation that accounted for alimentation as a special property of taste alone, emerged in his commentary on the De Anima, which Albert composed between 1254 and 57. In speaking. Considering the criteria by which to delineate taste and distinguish it from all remaining four senses, Abbott initially classified taste as a certain sense in the category of tangible senses, and subsequently turned to Aristotle's well-known distinction between internal and external media. Media played an important role in Aristotle's and also Abbott's theories of sensation. They helped them explain how sense objects interact with the environment when they affect the senses. External media, like air and water, were important in explaining how sense objects become visible, audible, and able to be smelled. The internal medium of the liquid body of saliva, as Abbott calls the medium of taste in contrast, was important to establish how sense objects become tasteable to coin a new word in English. Yet the definition of the medium of taste as a liquid body provoked the concern that taste is reducible to touch once again, right? Its material nature as a medium as opposed to a spiritual or intentional nature and its liquid quality as opposed to a dry quality both implied for Albert that what is material in taste is also tangible. This reference to the liquid quality nonetheless foreshadowed Albert's theoretical solution to the difficulty a solution which turned on a formal difference between taste and touch. And that's text six on your handout. The liquid is of such a material nature in the tasted object, but the flavor in the object is the active form in taste. And therefore taste is not a part of touch, but a certain species of sense, just like touch is too. Liquid is the proper matter of flavor in which it is diffused, and this is in accordance with its material being. Now, the substructural form matter composition helped Albert differentiate flavor, the active form, from liquid, its material carrier, in their causality on the sense of taste. Yet the application of the structure to the theme was already present in Averroes' long commentary on the De Anima. There Averroes says, I quote, the body in which flavors exist is not tasteable except on account of the fact that this flavor exists in this body in a liquid whose relation to flavor is as matter to form." Unquote. While Averroes anticipated Albert's commitment to a form-matter relation between flavor and liquid in a tasteable body in this way, he nonetheless did not draw the same conclusion as Albert. Albert suggested independently that only the material part in taste is tangible, whereas the formal part properly distinguishes taste from touch. In this way, he also parted from his earlier demarcation line of a conceptual distinction between taste as a sense of alimentation and taste as a sense of judgment of flavor in favor of a realist distinction that is grounded in the object of taste itself and coupled to taste as a sense of alimentation. Now, how does he do that? The new demarcation inspired by Averroes' insight was nonetheless cap was therefore capable of including Albert's previous identification of taste as a sense of judgment of flavor. As the active form of liquid and as that which is subject to change, Albert now suggested this flavor of alimentation is likewise subject to the judgment of taste. And you can find this in text sev seven, which I'm not gonna read right, right now. The judgment which the sense of taste exerts over flavor, the active form of constituent of the tasteable body, acquired an immediate connection to taste in this passage. The two contexts, which stood side by side earlier in Albert's De Homina, were now connected through the form-matter relation, which Albert borrowed from Averroes, and together accounted for the demarcation of taste from touch. Judgment of flavor remained a decisive aspect of distinguishing between taste and touch, yet it did so within one encompassing theory rather than two separate theoretical aspects. Albert may have propounded this encompassing theory as a self-corrective, but he tells us 
that it also accords with the teachings of, I quote, three authorities, Aristotle, Averroes, and Avicenna, unquote. That neither judgment of flavor, nor flavor as a formal aspect of a tasteable object, nor the combination of the two occurred in the three authorities in this way, was not of concern to Albert in this passage. What was at stake for him in Albert's final summary of the new demarcation that he proposed was how theory related to experience, or more precisely, how theory explained experience. And that's text eight in the handout. And in this way, it should be said that taste does not have an uh, extrinsic medium, but rather just as color is visible and properly acts on sight, so flavor is tasteable and acts on taste per se. But it does not act and perfect the sense of flavor by taste without humidity and actuality, as we've said. But just as it can be experienced when salt acts on taste, it also does not act without humidity, for because salt is well liquefied, it is dissolved once it is touched by humidity, it liquefies the tongue, and mixed with that humidity in a corporeal way, it acts on taste and not otherwise. Within the theoretical context of flavor as agent form, which is tasteable in itself if in liquid, and liquid as material medium which activates the formal agency of flavor, Abbott introduced the experience of salt's action on taste as an example. Salt was to be considered the agent form in liquid. Liquid, in turn, was the material medium. Salt acts on taste and as such elicits the judgment of taste. How salt is experienced as salt and how this particular judgment is passed by taste upon the experience of salt were the two epistemic moments that Albert could now explain together by way of his new form matter theory. Salt was not simply experienced as salt and judged to be such as salt alone, but it was experienced as an active form dissolved in a material liquid and on that basis judged by way of its elemental commixture. Earlier in his Dehomina, this judgment upon ta uh, of taste upon the flavor of salt had no explanatory roots in the formality of the object, since this theoretical aspect was not bound with taste as a sense of alimentation and with its entire accompanying explanatory apparatus. Habit's explicit appeal to expediri in his De Anima to the experiential value of the taste of salt in this passage, therefore, carried tremendous epistemic weight. The example of salt as, a, as an experience that can be repeated, transhistorical again, like in the first example, formulated in the same manner, indeed, served Albert to apply the general theory to the particular experience. Indeed, the particular experience helped him to establish his newfound theory as the best possible or most plausible explanation. When this best possible explanation was actually intimated by Albert and extended to other particular flavors, or whether this best possible explanation was actually intimated by Albert and extended to other particular flavors, such as sweet, fatty, bitter, and sour, and how exactly Albert reached the insight that this is the best possible explanation, remain yet again hidden in his own mental thoughts and were possibly never put on parchment. Nonetheless, in comparison, all these facets of the experiential value of salt, of the matching of the general to the particular, of establishing and validating the new theory in application, at least on paper or parchment, and its ontological value for demarcating taste from touch, were not on the radar of his Greek and Arabic sources. Avicenna, in contrast to Aristotle and Averroes, did not even mention salt among the eight specific flavors in his Liba de Anima 2.4, but added a reference to it in his canon. Aristotle and Averroes focused on the requirement of a liquid inclination in the different flavors. The example of salt simply served them both as a prime example of such inclinations, and those are texts 9a and b on your handout, which I'm also not going to read. Salt, then, is yet another indication that Albert trusted his authorities, but only in so far as he could mine their insights to establish the truth of his theory. To improve upon it in its explanatory value and to emphasize the value of experience as a transhistorical fact. But it did not mean that he followed their lead to the letter or adopted the epistemic value that they had placed into the example of salt. 
for concluding, I need some water again. <laughs> okay. So Albert continuously weighed the options of thought available to him at any given place and time and then decided on this basis the truth of each matter. His criteria for determining this truth concerning any particular natural scientific teaching derived not from authoritative or theological parameters, but from his own scientific and anthropological standards in theory and in practice. Authority was, as I hope to have shown in the two examples above, an instrument for truth making, but an instrument that was reworked in its arrangement and design. The scientific and anthropological criteria that ultimately anchored Albert's truth making of natural scientific teachings in their particulars were derived, in fact, from elsewhere. Now, if there's still five minutes, do I have five minutes, I would like to offer two glimpses into Albert's thinking that attests to his procedures. In his initial considerations on sensation in his De Anima, Albert composed one of his famous digressions, a self-standing insertion to fill scientific lacunae in Aristotle's works. His digression on book two focused on the grades and modes of abstraction, which Albert provided together with a clear pedagogical purpose, a purpose itself dependent in content on the signs of the soul that he explicated only in this book. That's text 10 on your handout. In this introductory passage to a whole book section, as in many others of its kind, Albert unhesitatingly applied epistemic principles to pedagogical purposes. The Aristotelian insight that human knowledge of common things is confused but prior with respect to us as human knowers found its applied expression in the order of study. This moved always from the common thing to its specific definition. Yet this movement could only occur once the different modes of abstraction available to humans were also known to the students of the science of the soul and potentially experienced by them in their learning. Sensation, imagination, estimation and understanding were not just distinct grades of apprehension for Albert but grades that he assigned them to order his science of the soul. It is, he says, by these grades of abstraction and separation that the powers of apprehension will be distinguished below." Unquote. Principles determined in the science of the soul found their immediate application in its subsequent explanations. Their truth, in other words, was not just validated in theory that was contained in them, in them but in the practices of the science practices which are found in its very formulation and disclosure. For Albert, the habits of commenting, studying, analyzing, weighing, and reworking ideas and arguments thus enabled the shaping and the determining of these scientific principles and truths. Conversely, these habits were themselves informed by the theories they established. Now, it was these criteria of truth anthropological and scientific that determined as principles and grounding standards Albert's use of sources, their usefulness, their locus, their shape, and their meaning. But they also fixed these sources in Albert's overarching scientific teleology. His goals of comprehensiveness expressed in specific definitional knowledge of all things natural. For the sake of leading the student's intellect to its tellers of perfected knowledge and completion ruled his scientific doings at large but also in their particulars, and that's text 11 on the handout. So, explaining sensation in teeth, and in so doing, appealing to experience in its evidentiary value without attention to the subject of this experience, added a particular universal truth to the comprehensive scientific knowledge of sentient beings, and consequently, to the student's intellectual growth. The study of particular and ennoble matters, such as the body of sentient beings, its members, and their causes, was worth everyone's time because of the noble and divine teleology inscribed as much in these objects of knowing as in the subjects of knowing. Abbott's intellectual practices of mining his Arabic natural philosophical sources were therefore pursued 
with the telos of gaining the truth, which he saw expressed in definitional knowledge and acquired for the sake of intellectual perfection. The two cases of the transistorization of empirical evidence and the independent theory construction as best possible explanation were subject to these epistemic ends. Abbott's concern to mine his sources were ultimately always rooted in the conviction of a shared nature, shared activities, and shared teleology, and particularly those who embarked on the study of the, science, of the natural sciences and the corpus of his philosophy as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katya. We still have about 10 minutes to questions, remarks. Roberto, please. Wait. Um. Thank you, Katya, so much for this beautiful uh, lecture. There are so many new subjects here because we're exploring um, especially this tradition regarding knowledge, knowledge of nature, experience, and the animalibus, and so on and so on. M my question is a very general one, uh, especially in the, in the second part of your presentation when you focus on taste. Um, the text you, you, you gave us, they actually talk about taste, but at the same time, at several different things, uh, in the sense that I, I was wondering, w what is the proper object of the investigations the texts are, in a sense, um, showing us? Because in a sense, this is about trying to understand the senses. But is there something also, it, does it mean something like investigating the body and what the body is? Uh, is it at the same time an attempt to understand body processes or processes in the body? Uh, is it something to understand about taste and the causes of taste or the characteristics of this, let's say so, external sense? How does it happen? Which causes uh, make uh, sense and taste possible, for example? So my, my question in a sense is, um, it seems to me that so many things in a sense are investigated together, the body, body processes, senses, characteristics of the different senses and perhaps also in which way this sense experiences connect to qualities of the things of the external world so that my question is in a sense uh, what is the specific question that is let us say so directing this investigation uh, processes and questions because it seems to me that in a sense, trying to understand the specific concerns also help us to understand what is, at least in this part of the history of Western philosophy, what we would call today empirical knowledge. Um, and so, also which kind of epistemology of sense experience is being proposed here. I don't, I don't know if you understood my question, but my question is in, in this regard, uh, which objects are really focused as the objects of investigation because that many things seems to be together even though the emphasis is on the understanding of taste as a specific external sense and the processes of taste and so on but it seems to me that this brings many other things together and what is the specific focus let us say so as a kind of uh, theory of um, uh, sense experience this particular question that I've looked at in the De Anima and also in the De Homina, it's just a question of, yeah, so in, in these texts that I quote here, it's just how it tastes different from touch. That's the question. It's very simple. Um, but of course, you're right that 
there are all these underlying questions of relations, of, um, of um, epistemology, of sense perception, um, of physiology, of anatomy, um, and as far as I can tell, I'm, I mean, obviously, Albert has many more questions afterwards um, that would have to be part of this investigation, too. But I wanted to focus on, like, the epistemic value that he grants this theory building and how he reshapes his theory in, in light of these sources um, and not on, like, the doctrinal development in itself, but also in, but only in relation to what sources he uses. Um, so that was my focus. But obviously all these other questions need exploring too, right? Um, and, and there's not so much scholarship out there on, on how sensation works, what kinds of um, ontological and epistemic um, convictions underlie the solutions and how that changes, how um, Galenic Avicennian medical knowledge might actually ch change the kinds of ontologies and epistemologies underlying this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and how, what sort of impact also the, the knowledge in the De Animalibus might have had onto these commentaries in the, uh, on the De Anima. Um, so those are all very valuable questions. So thanks for them. And um, they are definitely worth investigating further. Yeah. The floor is still open. Rodrigo. Just a very short remark out of sheer curiosity, because I know that in, in the Aristotelian tradition there is a problem regarding uh, the way you understand touch, because Aristotle has the general thesis saying that the sensorial organ, that you need to have a, a medium between the sensorial organ and the outside world. And on the other hand, people tend to place touch in the skin, but then you'd, you wouldn't have the medium. And this is a problem, and people say that sometimes Aristotle then placed the sensorial organ beneath the skin in order to have the skin as the medium between the sensorial organ and the outside world. It's really out of sheer curiosity how does uh, Albert uh, sees this, the, this problem. <laughs> So um, I have not studied touch, so I don't have an answer to this, but I'll send you an email. <laughs> More questions? Do you also uh, did you did you find uh, Katya in the text you have been investigating? Let's say so this this problem regarding how. Uh, together with an analysis of the senses, right, taste and touch and so on, there is this problem of how through the analysis of this external senses, let's say so, we get objective knowledge about the external world. You know, this is usually a very important problem in the history of skepticism, as you know. It's going to be, again, very important in modern philosophy. So I wondered if, if there is also s at some point in your research in which you touch this question in the sense of uh, describing taste and sense experiences uh, of taste and other senses and so on and so on, does it really convey a kind of knowledge about properties of things? So um, there are two things that um, I can say about this on the basis of the studies I've done so far. Um, as soon as um, Albert gets this form matter distinction, it's very helpful because you can what you get from the object itself is the form. Um, and so that informs, literally informs the sense and, and then gives you the ability to judge between the different types of taste or kinds of taste, salty, um, et cetera. Um, and that then informs you about the, the property of the, the flavor that's in the object itself, right? So that, that model, that explanatory model works. But as I've tried to show, he only gets this right in the, or he only gets the, the hang of it um, once he probably reads a, um, a various long commentary on the De Anima carefully on this matter and then incorporates it in his explanation. Um, so in this sense, we would have some sort of 
like Therese was arguing yesterday, kind of an ontological explanation of of how this works, right? Um, the getting to the properties or qualities of, of the external object. Now, my question to you would be like, what does objective knowledge of the external world mean? Um, and does that even apply objective in the sense as we would use it, or would it be another kind of objective, right? Um, so I would I would strongly say that objective knowledge here doesn't doesn't apply, um, but it's more a qualitative knowledge that they are after. Um, and if we take that into consideration, also especially for vision, I think um, that it's really about the qualities, and um, and then if we factor, if we start factoring in the common sensibles, right, and how they relate to the the proper sensibles, the qualities, then that gets really interesting. How you kind of build something about this, but I have no like ready-made answer for you just now because I'm going through the senses. Thank you very, very much. For the next conference, I have to turn off some lights. <laughs>